The stampede to cloud and massive VC investments has led to the emergence of a new generation of object store based data lakes and with them two important trends, actually three important trends. First, a new category that combines data lakes and data warehouses, AKA the lake house is emerged as a leading contender to be the data platform of the future. And this novelty touts the ability to address data engineering, data science and data warehouse workloads on a single shared data platform. The other major trend we've seen is query engines and broader data fabric virtualization platforms have embraced next gen data lakes as platforms for SQL centric business intelligence workloads reducing, or you know, some would even claim eliminating the need for separate data warehouses, pretty bold. However, cloud data warehouses have added complementary technologies to bridge the gaps with lake houses. And the third is many, if not most customers are embracing so-called, that are embracing the so-called data fabric or data mesh architectures. They're looking at data lakes as a fundamental component of their strategies. And they're trying to evolve them to be more capable hence the interest in lake house, but at the same time, they, they don't want to or can't abandon their data warehouse estates. As such, we see a battle royale is brewing between cloud data warehouses and cloud mm -hmm. lake houses. Is it possible to do it all with one cloud centric analytical data platform? Well, we're going to find out. My name is Dave Vellante and welcome to the data platforms power panel on theCUBE, our next episode in a series where we gather some of the industry's top analysts to talk about one of our favorite topics, data. In today's session, we'll discuss, discuss trends, emerging options, and the trade-offs of various approaches, and we'll name names. Joining us today are Sanjeev Mohan, who's the principal at Sanjmo, Tony Baer is principal at DB Insights, and Doug Henschen is the vice, pre vice president and principal analyst at Constellation Research. Guys, welcome back to theCUBE. Great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So with, it's early June and we're gearing up two major conferences, uh, several database conferences, <laughs> but two in particular that we're very interested in, Snowflake Summit and the Databricks Data and AI Summit. Doug, let's let's start off with you and then Tony and Sanjeev, if you could kindly weigh in. You know, where did this all start, Doug, the notion of, of lake house? And let's talk about what exactly we mean by lake house. Go ahead. Yeah, well, you, you nailed it in your intro, you know, one platform to address BI, data science, data engineering, uh, fewer platforms, less cost, less complexity, very compelling. Uh, you can credit Databricks for coining the term lake house uh, back in 2020, but it's really a much older idea. You can go back to Cloudera introducing their Impala database in 2012. That was a, a database on top of Hadoop. And indeed in that last decade, middle, by the middle of that last decade, there were several SQL on Hadoop products, uh, open standards like Apache Drill. And at the same time, the database vendors were trying to respond to this interest in machine learning and the data science. So they were adding SQL extensions, you know, the likes of Teradata and Vertica were adding SQL extensions to support the data science. Uh, but then later in that decade with the shift to cloud and object storage, you saw the vendors shift to this whole uh, cloud and object storage idea. So you had in the database camp, uh, Snowflake introduced Snowpark to try to address the data science needs. They introduced that in 2020 and last year they announced support for, for uh, Python. Um, you also had Oracle, SAP jumped on this lake house idea last year, supporting both the lake and warehouse, a single vendor, not necessarily quite single platform. Google very recently also jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, and then you also mentioned, um, you know, the this the SQL engine uh, camp, the, the Dremios, the Ahanas, the Starbursts, uh, really uh, doing two things, a fabric for distributed access to many data sources, but also very firmly planning that idea that you can just have the lake and we'll help you do the BI workloads on that. And then of course the data lake camp with the Databricks and Clouderas um, uh, pr providing a warehouse style deployments on top of their lake platforms. Okay, thanks, Doug. Now, I'd be remiss, those of you who know me know that I typically write my own intros. Uh, this time, my colleagues fed me a lot of that material. So th <laughs> thank you, you guys make it easy. But Tony, give us give us your thoughts on, on this, uh, this intro. Right, well, I very much agree with both of you, um, uh, which may not make for the most uh, you know, the exciting television in terms of that it has been an evolution, just like Doug said. I mean, for instance, you know, just to give an example, when Teradata bought Afterdata, it was initially seen as a platform, you know, as a hardware platform play. 
Uh, in the end, it was basically, it was all those aster functions that made a lot of sort of big data analytics, you know, accessible to SQL. And, and so what I really see the, you know, just in a more simpler definition or, or functional definition, the data lake house is really an attempt by the data lake folks to make the data lake friendlier territory to the SQL folks, and also to give into friendlier territory to all, all the data stewards who are basically concerned about the sprawl and the lack of control and governance in the data lake. Um, and so it, it's really kind of a continuing of an, of an ongoing trend. That being said, there's no action without count without counteraction. And of course, at the other end of the uh, of the other end of the spectrum, we also see a lot of the data warehouses trying to add things like in database machine learning. So they're certainly not surrendering without a fight. Um, again, as Doug was mentioning, this has been part of a continual blending of platforms that we've seen over the years that we first saw in the Hadoop years with SQL on Hadoop and 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 data warehouses starting to reach out to cloud storage. Um, uh, or, and, uh, or should say to HDFS, and then with the cloud, then going cloud native and therefore trying to um, break the silos down even further. Yeah, thank you. And, and Sanjeev, you know, data lakes, when we first heard about them, there was such a compelling name and then we realized all the problems associated with them. So, so pick it up from there. What would you add mm -hmm. to, to Doug and, and Tony? I would say, you know, these are excellent points that Doug and Tony have uh, brought to light. The concept of Lake House was going on, uh, to your point, Dave, a long time ago, <clears throat> long before the term was invented. For example, uh, in Uber, uh, Uber was trying to do a mix of Hadoop and Vertica because what they really needed were transactional capabilities that Hadoop did not have. So uh, they weren't calling it the Lake House, they were using multiple <laughs> technologies. But now they're able to collapse it into a single data store that we call uh, Lake House. Data lakes, excellent at batch processing, large volumes of data, but they don't have the real time capabilities such as change data capture, <coughs> doing inserts and updates. So this is why Lake House has become so important because they give us these transactional capabilities. Great, okay, so I'm interested, you know, is this, the name is great, Lake House, the concept is powerful, but I, I get concerned that it's a lot of marketing hype behind it. So I want to I want to examine that a bit deeper. How mature is the concept of, of Lake House? Are there practical examples that really exist in the real world that are, are driving business results for practitioners? Tony, maybe you could kick that off. Well, put it this way. Um, I think what's interesting is that both data lakes and data warehouses have each had to extend themselves. So it's not like, you know, the data, I mean, you know, to, to believe the Databricks hype, it's that this was just a natural extension of, of the data lake. In point of fact, Databricks had to go outside its core technology of Spark to make the lake house possible. Um, and it, it's a very similar type of thing on the part of the data warehouse folks in terms of that they've had to go beyond SQL. In the case of, you know, in the case of um, uh, Databricks, okay, there've been a number of incremental, you know, you know improvements, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, to Delta Lake, um, uh, you know, basically, you know, to basically you know, make the, uh, make the table format more performative, you know, for instance. But the other thing that I think the most dramatic change in all that is in their SQL engine. And they had to essentially pretty much abandon Spark SQL uh, because it really, you know, it, it, in of itself, Spark SQL is essentially stopgap solution. And if they want to really address that crowd, they had to totally reinvent SQL, or at least, you know, their SQL engine. And so Databricks SQL is not Spark SQL. It is not Spark. It's basically SQL that is adapted to run in a Spark environment, but the underlying engine is C++. It's not, you know, it's not scale or anything like that. Um, so Databricks had to you know, take a major detour outside of its core platform to do this. So to answer your question, this is not mature because these are all basically kind of, um, I mean, even though the idea of blending platforms has been going on for well over a decade, I would say that the current iteration is still fairly you know, immature. And in the cloud, I actually see basically a further uh, what I, was, I would I could see a further evolution of this because if you think through cloud native architecture, where you're essentially abstracting compute from data, there is no reason why if let's say you're dealing with say you know the same you know basically 
data targets, say cloud storage, you know, cloud object storage, that you might not apportion the tasks to different compute engines. And so therefore you could have, you know, for instance, let's, let's say you're Google, you could have big query, you know, perform, you know, perform basically the, you know, the, you know, the types of, uh, you know, you know, so, you know, the analytics, you know, the, the SQL analytics that would be associated with the data warehouse. And you could have big query ML that does some, uh, some in database, you know, machine learning, but at the same time for another part of the query, which might include, you know, which might involve, let's say some deep learning, just for example, you might go out to let, you know, say the sparks, you know, to the serverless spark service or to, or, 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 or to data proc. And there's no reason why Google could not blend all those into, into a coherent offering um, that's basically all triggered through microservices. And I say, and I just gave Google as an example, you could usually generalize that with all the other cloud or all the other third-party vendors. So I think we're still very early in the game uh, in terms of maturity of data lake houses. Thanks, Tony. So Sanjeev, is this, is this all hype? What are your thoughts? I, it's not hype but uh, completely agree. It's not mature yet. Lake houses have still a lot of work to do. So what I'm, I'm now starting to see is that the world is dividing into two camps. <clears throat> On one hand, there are people who don't want to deal with the operational aspects of vast amounts of data. They are the ones who are going for a BigQuery, Redshift, uh, Snowflake, Synapse, and so on because they want the platform to handle all the data modeling, access control, performance enhancements, but there's a trade-off. If you go with these platforms, then you are giving up on vendor neutrality. On the other side are those who have engineering skills. They want the independence. In other words, they don't want vendor lock-in. They want to transform their data into any number of use cases, especially uh, data science, machine learning use case. What they want is agility via open file formats using any compute engine. So why do I say lake houses are not mature? Well, cloud data warehouses, are they provide you an excellent user experience. That is the main reason why Snowflake took off. If you have thousands of tables, it takes minutes to, to get them started, uploaded into your warehouse and start experimentation. Table formats are far more resonating with the community than file formats. But once the cost goes up of cloud data warehouse, then the organization start exploring lake houses. But the problem is lake houses still need to do a lot of work on, on metadata. Apache Hive was a fantastic first attempt at it. Even today, Apache Hive is still very strong, but it's all technical metadata. And it has so many different res restrictions. Mm -hmm. That's why we see Databricks is investing into something <laughs> called Unity Catalog. Hopefully we'll hear more about Unity Catalog at, at the end of the month. But there's Great. a second problem uh, I, I just want to mention, and that is lack of standards. All these open source vendors, they're running what I call ego projects. You see on LinkedIn, they're constantly, you know, battling with, with each other, but, but the end user, they don't, end user doesn't care. End user wants a problem to be solved. They want to use Trino, Dremio, Spark from EMR, Databricks, Ahana, Das, Flink, Athena, but, but the problem is that we don't have common standards. Right. Oh, thanks. So Doug, I, I worry sometimes, I mean, I look at the space that we, we've, we've you know, debated for years, best of breed versus the full suite. Uh, you see AWS with whatever, 12 different plus, you know, data stores and different APIs and, and primitives. You got Oracle putting everything into its database. It's actually done some interesting things with MySQL Heatwave. So maybe there's proof points there, but Snowflake really good at data warehouse, simplifying data warehouse. Uh, Databricks really good at, at, at making lake houses actually more functional. Can one platform do it all? Well, uh, in a word, I can't be best of breed at all things. I think the upshot of uh, and a cogent analysis from Sanjeev there, uh, the, the database, the folk, the vendors coming out of the database uh, tradition, uh, they excel at the SQL, they're extending it into uh, data science, but when it comes to unstructured data, data science, ML, AI, uh, often a compromise. The data lake crowd, the, the uh, data bricks and such, uh, they've struggled to completely displace the data warehouse. When it really gets to the tough SLAs, uh, uh, they acknowledge that there's still a role for the warehouse. Maybe you can size down the warehouse and offload some of the, the BI workloads 
uh, and maybe in some of these SQL uh, engines, uh, good for ad hoc, minimized data movement, but really when you get to the uh, deep uh, service level uh, requirement, the high concurrency, the high query workloads, you end up creating something that's warehouse-like. Mm -hmm. Where do you guys think this market is headed? You know, what's going to take hold? Which projects are going to fade away? You got some things in Apache projects like you know, Hootie, Iceberg, <laughs> where, where do they fit? San Sanjeev, do you have any thoughts on that? So thank you, Dave. Um, so I, I feel that table formats are starting to mature. There is a lot of work that's being done. We will not have a single uh, product or single platform. We'll have a, a mixture. So we, I see a lot of Apache Iceberg in the news. Apache Iceberg is really uh, innovating. Their focus is on a table format. But then Delta and Apache Hoodie are doing a lot of uh, deep engineering work. For example, how do you handle high concurrency uh, when there are multiple writes going on? Uh, do you version your parquet files or, or how do you uh, do your upsets, uh, basically? So, so different focus. Uh, at the end of the day, the end user will, will decide what is the right platform, but we are going to have uh, multiple uh, formats uh, living with us for a long time. D Doug, is Iceberg in your view, something that's going to address some of those, those gaps in standards that Sanjeev was talking about earlier? Yeah, Delta Lake, Hootie, Iceberg, they all address this need for consistency and scalability. Uh, Delta Lake open technically, but open for access. I, I don't hear about Delta Lakes in any world, but mm -hmm. uh, the Databricks hearing a lot of buzz about Apache Iceberg. End users want an open performance standard and most recently uh, Google uh, embraced Iceberg for its recent uh, a big lake. Their uh, stab at having, uh, supporting both lakes and warehouses on one, one conjoined platform. And, and, and Tony, of course you remember the early days of the sort of big data movement. You had uh, MapR was the most closed. Mm -hmm. You had Hortonworks the most open. You had Cloudera in between. There was always this kind of, you know, contest right. as to who's the most open. Does that, does that matter? Are we going to see a repeat of that here? I think it's spheres of influence. Uh, I think, and, and, and Doug very much was kind of a, um, uh, referring to this. I, I would call it kind of like the, the MongoDB syndrome, which is that, you have a, and I'm talking about MongoDB before they changed their license, open source project, but very much associated with MongoDB, which basically, you know, control, you know, which, you know, pretty much control the, you know, most of the contributions and the decisions. And I think Databricks has the same, you know, ironclad hold on, on Delta Lake, but still the market is pretty much associated Delta Lake as the Databricks open source project. I see Iceberg, I mean, you know, Iceberg is probably further advanced than, than Hootie in terms of mind share. Um, and so what I see this breaking down to is essentially the, you know, you know, basically the Databricks open source versus the, you know, the community, you know, the everything else open source, the community open source. So I see it's a very similar type of breakdown uh, that I see repeating itself here. So, you know, by the way, Mongo uh, has a conference next week, another, another data <laughs> platform is kind of not really relevant to this discussion totally, but, but in the sense it is because yeah. there's a lot of discussion on earnings calls uh, these last couple of weeks about consumption and who's exposed. Obviously people are concerned about, about Snowflake's consumption model. Mongo is maybe less exposed because Atlas isn't as, 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 as prominent in the, in the portfolio, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I wanted to bring up, the little bit of controversy that we saw come out of the Snowflake earnings call where the Evercore analyst asked Frank Slootman about discretionary spend. And Frank basically said, look, we are not discretionary. You know, we are deeply operationalized. Whereas he kind of poo-pooed the, 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 the lake house or the data lake, et cetera, saying, oh yeah, data scientists will pull files out and, you know, play with them. Mm. That's, that's really not our business. What do you, does it, do you, any of you have comments on that? Help us squint <laughs> through that controversy. Who wants to take that one? Let's put it this way. The SQL folks are from Venus and the data scientists are from Mars. That means it really comes down to, I think, <laughs> sort, of, sort of that type of perception. Uh, the fact is, is that, you know, traditionally with analytics, it was very SQL oriented uh, and that basically the quants were kind of off in their corner on their, you know, whether they're using SAS or, or whether they're using Teradata. Um, I see what you know. It's really a, a great leveler today, which is that they're they're 
you're, I mean, basically Python has become a very, you know, it's become arguably one of the most popular programming languages, uh, depending on what month you're looking at, at the title you know, index. Um, and of course, obviously, SQL is, as I tell the MongoDB folks, SQL is not going away. You have a large, you know, uh, skills base out there. Um, and, and so uh, basically <laughs> I see this breaking down to essentially, you're going to have each you know, group that's going to have its own natural, you know, preferences for its home turf. Um, and the fact that, you know, that, uh, that basically that, 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 uh, that all the, you know, let's say the Python and Scala folks are, or often, you know, using Databricks does not make them any less operational or mission critical than the SQL folks. Anybody else yeah, want to I, chime in on that one? Yeah, Tom? I totally agree with that. Um, you know, uh, Python support in, in, in Snowflake is very nascent uh, with all of Snowpark, all of the things outside of SQL, they're very much relying on partners to make things possible, make data science possible. And it's been, it's very early days. I think the bottom line, what we're going to see is each of these camps is going to keep working on doing better at the thing that they don't do today or they're new to, uh, but they're not going to nail it. They're not going to be best of breed on, on both sides. So the SQL centric companies and shops are going to do more data science on their database centric platform. The data science driven companies might be doing more BI on their lakes with those vendors and the companies that have highly distributed data uh, they're going to add fabrics to, and maybe offload more of their BI onto those engines like Dremio and Starburst. So, so I've asked you this before, but I'll ask you Sanjeev. So it's, it's, it's Snowflake and Databricks are such great examples because you have the data engineering crowd trying to go into data warehousing and you have the data warehousing guys trying to go into to the sort of lake territory. Snowflake has $5 billion in the balance sheet. And, and I've, I've asked you before, I'll ask you again, it, doesn't there has to be a semantic layer between these two worlds? Does Snowflake go out and do M and A and maybe buy an at scale or a data mirror, or is that just sort of a band aid? What, what are your thoughts on that, Sanjeev? So I, yeah, some, I, I think semantic layer is, uh, is is the metadata, the business metadata is extremely important. At the end of the day, the business folks they'd rather go to the business metadata than have to figure out. Uh, where, like, for example, like, let's say, you know, um, I, I want to update somebody's email address and uh, we have a lot of like, you know, overhead with data residency laws and all that. I want my platform to give me the metadata, business metadata, so I can write my business logic without having to worry about which database, which location. So, so having that semantic layer is extremely important. Uh, in fact, now we are, we are taking it to the next level. Now we are saying that it's not just a semantic layer, it's all my KPIs, all my calculations. So how can I make those calculations independent of the compute engine, independent of the BI tool and, be, and make them fungible? So more disaggregation of the stack, but it gives us more best of breed products that the customers have to worry about. So I want to ask you about this, the stack, you know, the modern data stack, if you will. And we always talk about injecting machine intelligence, AI into applications, making them more data driven. But when you look at the application development stack, it's, it's, it's separate. You know, the database is, tends to be separate mm -hmm. from, from the data, the data and analytics stack. Do those two worlds have to come together in the modern data world and what, what yeah. does that look like organizationally? I, I think it, it is, so organizationally, even technically, I think it is starting to happen. Microservices architecture was the first attempt to bring the application and the data world together, but they are fundamentally different things. Like for example, if an application crashes, that's horrible, but Kubernetes will, will self heal and it'll bring the, the application back up. But if a database crashes and corrupts your data, we have a huge problem. So, so that's why I, they have traditionally been two different stacks. They are starting to come together, uh, especially with data ops, for instance, versioning of, of the way we write business logic. You know, it used to be our business logic was highly embedded into our database of choice. But now we are disaggregating that using GitHub, CI, CD, the whole DevOps tool chain. So, so data is catching up to the way applications are. 
They also have databases that uh, trans analytical databases. That's a little bit of what the story is with MongoDB next week with uh, uh, adding more analytical capabilities. But I think uh, companies that talk about that are always careful to couch it as operational uh, analytics, not right. the warehouse level workloads. So we're we're making progress, but I think uh, there's there's always going to be um, uh, or there will long be a separate analytical data platform. And um, uh, until you know, data mesh takes over, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, now I'm now opening a can of worms. So okay. <laughs> well, but wait, wait, I know it's out of scope here, but wouldn't data mesh say, hey, do, do take your best of breed? To Doug's earlier point, you can't be best of breed at everything. Wouldn't data mesh advocate? Do lake lake data lakes do your data lake thing data warehouse do your data lake then you're just a node on the mesh. <laughs> now you need separate data stores and you need separate you know teams. But well, to my point, I, I think that I mean put it this way: um, <laughs> data mesh itself is a logical view of the world. It's not you know the data mesh is not necessarily we were on we're on the lake or on, or on the warehouse. I think for me the you know the big the fear there is more in terms of you know the silos of governance that could happen and the and the siloed views of the world how we redefine how, and that's why and I want to go back to something that Sanji said which is that it's going to be raising the importance of the semantic layer now does snowflake that raises that opens a, a couple of pandora's boxes here which is one does snowflake dare go into that space or do they risk basically alienating basically you know their their partner ecosystem which is a key part of their whole appeal which is best of breed they're kind of the same situation that, that Informatica was in the early 2000s when Informatica briefly flirted with analytic applications and realized that was not a good idea. Uh, they need to redouble down on, on, on their core, which was data integration. Um, uh, the other thing though that <clears throat> raises the importance of, and this is where the, you know, the best of breed comes in, is the data fabric. I, <clears throat> my contention is that if you, and whether you use you know, uh, you know, employee data mesh practice or not, if you do employ a data mesh, you need data fabric. If you deploy a data fabric, you don't need that. So, you know, do you do um, practice data mesh? But data fabric at its core, and admittedly, it's a it's a it's a it's it's a category that's still very poorly defined and evolving. But at its core, we're talking about a common metadata backplane, something that we used to talk about with master data management. This is this would be something. Um, that would be more um, what I would, I would say, basically, you know, uh, mutable. That would be more, you know, that would be more um, evolving. You know, basically using, let's say, you know, machine learning to kind of uh, so that we don't have to predefine rules or predefine what the world looks like. Um, but so I think in the long run, what this really means is that whichever way we implement, on whichever physical platform we implement, we need to all be speaking the same metadata language. And I think at the end of the day regardless of whether it's a lake, warehouse, or lake house, we need that, we need common metadata. Doug, can I come back to something you, you pointed out that those talking about bringing analytic and transaction databases together, you, you had talked about operationalizing those and the caution there. Uh, educate me on MySQL Heatwave. I was surprised when Oracle put so much effort in that and you may or may not be familiar with it, but, but a, a lot of folks have talked about that now it's got nowhere in the market, no market share, but a lot of you've seen these benchmarks from Oracle. How real is that bringing together those two worlds and, and eliminating ETL? Yeah, I have to defer on that one. That's my colleague, Holger Mueller. He wrote the, he wrote the report um, on that. He's way deep on it. And I have, uh, have yeah, not gone deep on it. Okay. I, I just, I wonder if that is something that's, you know, how real that is, or if it's just Oracle marketing. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Or we can I'm pretty familiar with, with Heatwave. Uh, it's essentially Oracle doing what, I mean, it's kind of a parallel with what Google's doing with AlloyDB. It's an operational database that will have some embedded analytics. Um, and it's also something which, um, you know, I expect to start seeing with MongoDB. Uh, and I think basically, you know, Doug and Sanjeev were kind of, you know, referring to this before about basically kind of like the operational analytics, you know, that are basically, you know, uh, that are basically embedded within an operational database. The idea here is that, the last thing you want to do with an operational database is slow it down. So you're not going to be doing very complex deep learning or anything like that, but you might be doing things like, you know, classification, you might be doing some predictives. Um, in other words, like, you know, we've, you know, we've just concluded a transaction with this customer, but was it less than what we were expecting? What does that mean in terms of, is this customer likely to churn? I think we're going to be seeing a, a lot of that. And I think that's what a lot of what MySQL heat wave is all about. Whether Oracle has, 
you know, uh, any presence in the market. Now it's still a pretty new announcement, but the other thing that's going, that, you know, that, that kind of goes against Oracle <laughs> that, that they had to battle against is that even though they own MySQL and run the open source project, everybody else, it, you know, in terms of the actual commercial implementation, it's associated with everybody else. And the popular perception has been that MySQL has been basically kind of like a sidelight for Oracle. And so it's on Oracle's shoulders to prove that they're damn serious about it. Yeah, it's no coincidence that MariaDB was launched the day that Oracle acquired Sun. Uh, Sanjeev, I wonder if we could come back to a topic that we, we discussed earlier, which is this notion of consumption. Uh, obviously Wall Street's very concerned about it. Snowflake dropped prices last week. I've always felt like, hey, the consumption model is the right model. I can dial it down in when, when I need to. Of course, the, the street freaks out. W what are your thoughts on just yeah. pricing, the consumption model? What's the right model for, for companies, for customers? Consumption model is here to stay. Uh, what I would like to see, and I think it is an ideal situation, and actually plays into the lake house concept, is that I, I have my data in some open format, maybe it's Parquet or CSV or JSON, uh, Avro, and I can bring whatever engine is the best engine for my workloads, bring it on, pay for consumption, and then shut it down. And by the way, that could be Cloudera. You know, we don't talk about yeah. Cloudera very much, but uh, you know, it could be uh, uh, one business unit wants to use Athena. Another business unit wants to use, uh, you know, some other, uh, you know, Trino, let's say, uh, Dremio. So every business unit is working on the same data set. See, that's mm -hmm. critical. But that data set is maybe in their VPC and they bring any uh, compute engine, you pay for the use, shut it down. That then you're getting value and you're only paying for consumption. Uh, it's not like, you know, I left uh, a cluster running by mistake, um, you know, so there have to be guardrails. FinOps, this, the reason FinOps is so big is because it's very easy for me to run a, a, a Cartesian join in the cloud and get a $10,000 bill. Well, it looks like it's been a sort of a victim of its own success in some ways. They've made it so easy to spin up uh, single node instances, multi-node instances. And back in the day when uh, compute was, uh, you know, scarce and costly, those uh, database engines optimized every last bit so they could get as much workload as possible out of every instance. Today, it's really easy to spin up a new node, a new multi-node cluster. Uh, so that freedom has uh, meant many more nodes that aren't necessarily getting that utilization. So yeah. Snowflake has been doing a lot to add reporting, monitoring dashboards around the utilization of all the nodes and multi-node instances that have spun up. And meanwhile, we're seeing some of the uh, uh, traditional on-prem databases that are moving into the cloud, trying to offer that freedom. And I think they're going to have that same discovery that the, mm -hmm. the cost surprises are going to follow as they make it easy to spin up new instances. Yeah, a lot of money went into the this this market over the last decade, separating compute from storage, moving to the cloud. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad you mentioned Cloudera, Sanjeev, because we, we, they got it all started. You know, the kind of big data movement. Uh, we don't talk about them that much. I, I, I sometimes I wonder if it's because when, when they merged Hortonworks and Cloudera, they dead ended both platforms, but then they did invest in in a more modern platform. But what's the future of of Cloudera? What are you seeing out there? Cloudera has a, has a good product. I, I have to say uh, the problem in, in our space is that there are way too many companies. There's way too much noise. We are expecting the end users to parse it out, uh, you know, or, or we're expecting analyst firms to uh, boil it down. So, so the, the, I think marketing becomes a big problem. Uh, as far as technology is concerned, I think Cloudera, did turn themselves around, and uh, uh, Tony, I know you you talk to them quite frequently. Right. I, I think they have a quite a comprehensive uh, offering uh, for a long time. Actually, you know, they bought could they created Kudu, so they got right. operational. They have Hadoop. They have uh, an operational data warehouse. They migrated to the cloud. They are in hybrid multi-cloud uh, environment. A lot of uh, Data cloud data warehouses are not hybrid. They're right. only in the cloud. Right. 
Right. I think I think what Cloudy has done the most has been most successful has been in the transition to the cloud. Um, and the fact that they're giving their customers more on-ramps to it, more hybrid on-ramps. So I give them a lot of credit there. They're also have been trying to position themselves as being the most price friendly in terms of that we will put more you know, guardrails and governors on it. Um, I mean, part of that could be part of that could be spin, but on the other hand, they don't have the same uh, vested interest in compute cycles as say AWS would have, you know, you know, you know with, with EMR. Um, that being said, yes, you know, cloud area does it, you know, I think it's most powerful appeals of that is it, it almost sounds in a way, um, I don't want to, you know, you know, cast them as a legacy system, but the fact is they do have a huge landed legacy on-prem and a huge and, and still significant potential to land and expand that, you know, to the, you know, to the cloud. Um, that being said, you know, even though cloud area is multifunction, there are, I think it, it certainly has its strengths and weaknesses. And the fact is, is that yes, cloud area has it, you know, an operational database uh, or, you know, an operational data store with it kind of like the outgrowth of, of age base, but it's still, cloud area is still based, you know, primarily known for the deep analytics, you know, you know, the, the operational database, nobody's going to buy cloud era or, or cloud era data platform strictly for the operational database. They may use it as an, as an add-on um, just in the same way that a lot of, you know, customers have used, let's say Teradata to basically to, to do, you know, to do some machine learning um, or, you know, or, or any of the, or any of the other basically, or, or let's say, you know, Snowflake to, you know, to parse through JSON. So uh, again, it's not an indictment or anything like that, but the fact is obviously they do have their strengths and their weaknesses. I think their greatest opportunity is with their existing base because that base has a lot in that had invested and vested. And the fact is they do have a high, you know, a hybrid path that a lot of the others lack. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, being on the quarterly shot clock was not a good place to be under the Microsoft no. for, for Cloudera. And now they at least can, you know, refactor the business accordingly. I'm glad, glad you mentioned hybrid too. We saw, we saw Snowflake uh, last month, did a deal with Dell, whereby non-native Snowflake data could access on-prem uh, object store uh, from Dell. They announced a similar thing with pure storage. What, what do you guys make of that? Is that just, is that, how significant will that be? Will customers actually do that? I think they're using either materialized views or, or extended hey, tables. There, there are data rate of residency tables. requirements. There are, there are desires yes. to, uh, to have, uh, you know, these platforms in uh, your own data center. And uh, finally they capitulated. I mean, Frank Slootman is uh, famous for saying to be very focused and uh, uh, earlier, not many months ago, they called the uh, going on-prem uh, as, as, as a distraction, but clearly there's enough demand and certainly government uh, uh, contracts, uh, any, uh, any company that has data residency requirements, uh, it's a real need. So they finally addressed it. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll, I'll bet dollars to donuts. There was a, an EBC session, and the big some big customer said, <laughs> "If you don't do this, we ain't doing business with you." And that was like, "Okay, we'll do it." You know. It was, so, your, so Dave, Dave I, I have to say, you know, earlier on you had brought this point how Frank Slootman was poo-pooing data science workloads. Uh, on your show about a year or so ago, he said, we are never going to on-prem. We burnt that bridge. <laughs> that was on He's, your show, I think. I just, I remember, I, I was, I remember exactly the statement yeah. because it was interesting. He said, we're never going to do the half halfway house. And I think what he meant is we're not going to bring <laughs> the snowflake architecture to, to run on-prem because it defeats the, the elasticity of the cloud. So this was kind of a capitulation in a way, yeah, yeah. but I think it still preserves his original intent, sort of. I don't know. It's just well, the, the, the point. The point here is that every vendor will poo-poo, you know, as whatever they don't have uh, I, until they do have it. Yeah. Yes. And then yes. it'll be like, oh, we are all in. We, you know, we've always been doing this. We have always supported this, and this, and now we are doing it better than others. I, Look, it, I, it was the same type of shockwave that we got that we felt basically uh, when when AWS at the last moment at one of their reinvents said, oh, by the way, we're going to introduce outposts, and you know the analyst group you know is typically pre-briefed about a week or two ahead under NDA, and that was not part of it. And when and when they drop, they just casually drop that in the analyst session. It's like, 
you could have you could have heard the sound of lots of analysts changing their diapers at that point. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> I, I know props to Andy Jassy, who who once many times actually told us never say never when it comes to AWS. Yeah, so yeah. guys, we got I know we got to run. We got some hard stops. Maybe you could each give us your final thoughts. Doug, uh, start us off, and then. Sure. Well, you know, we've got uh, the Snowflake Summit coming up. Uh, I'll be looking for uh, uh, customers that are really doing data science that are really employing Python uh, through Snowflake, uh, through Snowpark. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, we've got uh, Databricks with their Data and AI Summit in San Francisco. I'll be looking for customers that are really doing considerable uh, BI workloads. Last year, I did a market overview of this analytical data platform space, 14 vendors, eight of them uh, claim to support uh, Lake House, both sides of the camp. Uh, Databricks uh, customer had uh, 32, their, their top customer that they could cite was unnamed. It had 32 concurrent users doing 15,000 uh, queries per hour. That's good, but it's not up to the most demanding uh, BI SQL workloads. And uh, they acknowledged that and said they need to keep working that. Uh, Snowflake, uh, asked for their biggest data science uh, customer. They cited Kabula, 400 terabytes, 8,500 users, 400,000 uh, data engineering jobs per day. I took the data engineering uh, job to be probably SQL centric ETL style uh, transformation work. So I want to see the real um, uh, use of the Python, how uh, how much Snowflake has grown as a, uh, Snowpark has grown as a way to support data science. Great. Tony? Yeah, actually, uh, of all things, and uh, certainly, you know, um, I'll still be looking for similar things as what Doug is saying, but I think sort of like kind of um, kind of out of left field, I'm interested to see what MongoDB is going to start to say about operational analytics. Because I mean, they're basically, you know, they're into this conquer the world strategy. We can be all things to all people. Okay, if that's the case, what's, you know, what's going to be, you know, you know, what's going to be a case with, you know, basically, you know, putting in some inline analytics, what are you going to be doing with your query engine? So that's actually kind of an interesting and it's going to be a you know, thing I'm really looking for next week. Great. Sanjeev. Yeah. You some. yeah. So, so I, I'll be at MongoDB World Snowflake and Data Breaks and uh, very interested in seeing, uh, since Tony brought up uh, MongoDB, I see that even the databases are shifting tremendously. They are, you know, addressing both, uh, uh, the edge tap use case, uh, online uh, transactional and analytical. I'm also seeing that these databases started in, let's say in case of MySQL Heatwave as, as relational or in MongoDB as document, but now they've added graph, they've added time series, they've added geospatial, uh, and they just keep adding more and more uh, data structures and really making these databases multifunctional. <coughs> So yeah, very that, yeah, it get, gets back to our discussion of best of breed, you know, versus all in one. And, and, and you know, it's likely Mongo's path or part of their strategy, of course, is through developers. They're very developer focused. So we'll be looking for that. And guys, you know, I'll be there as well. I'm hoping that we maybe have some extra time on the cube. So please stop by and, cool. and uh, we can maybe chat a little bit. Guys, as always, fantastic. Thank you so much, Doug, Tony, Sanjeev. And let's do this again. It's been a pleasure. All right, and thank you for watching. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE and the excellent analyst. We'll see you next time. See you next time.